Hi everybody, good morning. Um, welcome. Welcome to my studio. I am Kim Santini and I'm a painter. And um, I'd like to welcome those of you who don't know me or my work. I got the idea in the middle of the night that it might be it might be cathartic and healing and maybe a nice distraction for me to paint live today from the studio. So um, perhaps I will show you the piece that I did yesterday. So I created this piece yesterday um, and this was sort of the piece that started it all up. This is a 16 by 20 canvas and I was working out my frustrations and my emotions kind of in a very raw fashion. Um, and I was really, I hesitated before sharing this online, but I was really um, encouraged by the response and um, realized that this sort of a process, it might be beneficial for other people to see. So I thought at 3 a.m., why? Why not do another? So, here I am in an impromptu session, and I have an uh, old piece here on the easel that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but my plan is to just sort of um, freestyle. Would that be the right word? Um, I'm just gonna I, I'm gonna work on a piece and um, channel my emotions. It's election day here in the U.S. and the months leading up to this with all of the other things that are happening in the world with the pandemic, um, with Black Lives Matter, with um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg passing away. There's just been so many situations um, th that have, see I don't even have words, they're, they're, that merit an emotional response, a sense of grieving, a call to action, and, and they're coming so fast and furiously that it's been difficult to process. And, um, Beanie is chasing the cat. Come here. But, um, so anyway, uh, I used my art yesterday as a healing process or a way to work through those emotions, and I'm going to continue to do that today. Um, instead of sitting and um, doom scrolling or twiddling my thumbs, I'm laughing because my daughter is building a barricade out of moving boxes to keep the puppy out of here. It's kind of comical what happens in our house. You gotta, you gotta laugh, right? Because, because tears don't, don't do anything. Um, but anyway, so I'm rambling. But welcome. Good morning. Uh, I hope you have a cup of coffee or a good mug of tea and uh, are able to join me for a few minutes this morning. I haven't done a live paint or demonstration in, on Facebook in quite some time. And this one is particularly flying by the seat of my pants. So um, you're going to get a true raw look at how I work. Um, it, it isn't going to be cleaned up or polished or edited in any way. This is this is it. This is me and my painting process, and um, hopefully, hopefully the end result is going to be something worthwhile. So, um, yeah, uh, I work in acrylic paints, and I also have lately been using a lot of other um, tools in my work, like uh, ink pencils, watercolor pencils, graphite. Um, so you're going to see me bring in other marks to the surface that aren't necessarily paintbrush origin, of, or, of paintbrush origin or paint origin. Feel free to ask your questions in the comments section. I am painting and um, I'm going to try to talk a little bit through it, but I do tend to get lost in the process at times depending on the concentration or amount of focus that the piece requires. But I do have my laptop here in the background, and so periodically I'll take a break, pull up comments on my laptop, and try to respond to them. So it may not be in an actual linear, um, true time sort of fashion, but I'll do my best to answer them. Um, 
And I also want to say that if this sort of content is interesting to you, if you want to learn more about my process, my decision making, um, and those sorts of things, I invite you to come to my online classroom. I have a space on Patreon, I call it my magic space, and I invite students who are in that magic space, they are all invited into my studio for a studio visit, usually once, sometimes twice a week. Uh, and we talk about the things that I'm thinking about, the things that are impacting the work that I'm making, um, my idea process, my materials process, the different experiments that I'm taking, the way I'm pushing my tools, those sorts of things. Um, I invite you to, to join that. And there is a link to um, my Patreon space. It's on my Facebook page. It's also on my website. But if you can't find that, please message me and I'll get that to you directly. Um, but right now, I just sort of want to start in with uh, a little introduction on this piece and my process. So uh, welcome again. And if you missed, this is an acrylic painting. It's actually on a piece of hardboard. Um, this is a panel, let's see, it's 18 by 24, and it has a previous painting on it. And this previous painting is over another painting, and that's over another painting, and over another painting. Um, I really like to work over top of old paintings um, because what happens is that there's, there's what I call peekaboo pockets. Um, by the end phase, uh, and, and what a peekaboo pocket is, is it's just little bits and pieces of the marks that are here right now. Um, they'll be retained and uh, part of, or they'll become part of the final piece. Uh, and, and there's just a really wonderful sort of call and response that happens when I work over top of something that already has marks on it versus working on a brand new um, surface with a, a flat or um, monocolored underpainting on it. Um, there is a lot of texture on this piece already and honestly if it weren't cold outside today I would have um, gone out and gotten a sander and sanded this down in some places just to create a difference between smooth areas and texture but um, I hate the cold for one um, and, and secondly, I also kind of feel like the texture, the rawness, the, the um, grit here sort of reflects what I'm feeling today. And since this demo is all about painting what you feel or painting what I'm feeling, I'm going to let it go. The other thing that, um, that I, that I want to ad address is that it's important to... For me as a creator, it's important that I step out of my comfort zone and that I do things that make me uncomfortable. So if I always set up a safe environment and created the same way all the time, my paintings would be really boring and static. So forcing myself to um, work on a surface that maybe isn't completely perfect from the, from the onset will really give me a little edge, help me to think things through differently. It may work, it may not work, but it's about the process, not about the end result. So um, I just wanna, I just wanted to address that. So Mary Bell is asking how I do my background. Well, this is actually a previous painting. It's from a number of years ago. Um, it hasn't sold and so I'm of the frame of mind if I still have a painting in my possession, after a few years, it's always a candidate for a rework. So um, this piece is from my Siren series, and while you probably cannot see this on camera, there is lots of layers of marks. I actually have um, spirograph fractals drawn on here and sized into the paint along with this figure in the, in the hawk. So um, these things are gonna all go. They're gonna all disappear. I'm not going to try to honor her or the hawk um, I, because I don't feel a connection to that message or that piece of it this morning. Um, I, I do feel her pensiveness and, and the fact that she's seeking something. So I may take that element into the incarnation of this piece, but I'm not, I'm not married to retention of any of this part of my original focus. Um, 
So, Tess, you want to know if it's been varnished? I don't varnish my pieces until they've sold. Uh, I put a, a fresh coat of varnish on them before I send them out the door. That way I don't have to sand them down if I decide to rework them. But what I do with a piece before I put it in storage is that I put a coat of gel medium over top of it, just a clear coat of gel medium. And what that does is it acts as a barrier between the painted marks and the environment that the painting sits in. And hopefully if there are any scratches that happen or um, another painting sticks to it, it sticks to that gel medium and not to the paint itself. Although I can tell there's a scuff mark on this piece that I discovered when I pulled it out. Um, so the gel medium did not protect some of the higher areas where there was texture. Um, and I would have had, had this piece sold, I would have had to repair that area and then varnished the whole painting before shipping it out. So that's a great question, thanks. Um, so in keeping with this piece that I did yesterday, and I'm gonna bring it back to you. This piece was also a rework of an earlier painting. It did actually have a horse head, although the horse was completely in profile and um, very geometric around the perimeter of the page or the, the canvas originally. Um, what I did was I just went in over top of it and I, and I started scribbling. And I was using marks and colors that represented what I was feeling, my emotional state. So I'm gonna take that same approach today. Now, the difference between the two pieces is that um, with the one I did yesterday, the horse was already there and I wanted to retain him. I don't really have a shape or a focal point here that I'm interested in retaining. Um, so my marks are gonna be completely free form and um, not related to any sort of composition or design that's already laid down on the piece. I am, I know I keep stepping off camera to grab things. Sorry about that. I am going to start out with some um, ink tents or ink blocks. This is a um, water soluble product that's made by Derwent and um, I'm just gonna go ahead, I'm gonna put some music on. Um, I can't stream music online because of um, copyrights, but I'm gonna put some music on and I'm gonna play it into my headphones so you won't hear it. But I'm, I'm just gonna listen to the music and I'm gonna think about what I'm feeling and I'm gonna channel marks, move my hands um, in a way that sort of represent or mirror that. And this may not feel like it's a completely obvious sort of thing. Um, it, it's a practice that I've been doing for a long time. So uh, I sort of just kind of listen and think and then close my eyes and allow the movement to happen. Um, I have chosen a, a pretty bright blue here. I'm thinking that I want to go darker, but if I go dark right away, then color isn't going to show up. So I kind of like some color to be there and then the darkness to, to get laid over top of it. So I'm just going to get to work. Oh, I also want to mention that I put a coat of clear gesso over top of this painting so that it had a tooth. Um, because if it because it's acrylic paints, they're kind of slick, and um, I want to be able to add some drawing style marks to this um, and I need a tooth in order for that to happen. So here we go. So just a few marks down to get started. Now these are water soluble, so they're gonna move when I hit, when I bring in paint and other things. Um, 
I'm going to turn this music off because I don't want to have multiple things going on in my head at once. Um, so when I hit them, when I go and I lay more marks in over top, it's going to pick up the pigment in these um, sticks. And that's why I, I use them and lay them down because they'll exist on their own as, um, as lovely lines. But then what will also happen is they'll, they'll change and transfer and sort of bleed into the paint itself, which is a wonderful effect. So... Um, I have my palette set up off camera, and um, I can only do one camera angle for you today. You see how this is picking up the paint? There are times when I record these sessions and I do multiple camera angles so that you can see me mixing color on my palette which I know is a huge added bonus to those of you who are painters. You want to see how I'm loading up the paint and working um, with my color options. And um, I apologize that I can't share that with you today. I'm also putting a glove on um, because I like to get my hands in the paint. And I don't want to, I don't want to show you by poor example. So I'm just mixing up some colors here. Of paint and going in and, and picking things up. Moving some of this blue around. my palette off camera that's what you hear so it doesn't dry out and now I'm just I'm grabbing a paper towel and some acrylic medium and I'm gonna thin with water love being able to do this, play with the property of the paint, and really push, push it in some areas. Encourage those drips, change these drawn lines into painted marks. I love the sort of uh, interplay that gets to happen here. Of it. I'm going to spray some of the painted marks too and see if I can get those to drip. They may, they may not. It doesn't matter at this point. It's all just, just a what if. Um, I know that I love this drippiness, this juiciness, and I actually really love this color here. So oh, why not let it move? Why not let it take over some more of the canvas or the, the surface here? So Patty, you've asked about the texture on the original painting and what created it. Um, I truly don't remember what all the various steps were in the previous piece because it's so old and it's on top of another piece, which is on top of another piece. Um, but based on the age of this painting, um, my guess is that it's uh, the majority of the texture here is all acrylic based and um, probably tar medium along with some heavy body and maybe some molding paste. Um, and I use all golden products, so those would all have been from the golden um, catalog of materials. Um, I'm going to bring in a blow dryer right now, and I am going to hit this with the blow dryer. I apologize for that noise, but I guess that's part of, part of going live, right? Um, but I'm going to force this dry for now.
flip the piece over while I was blowing it dry. It's important to look at a piece from multiple angles. I don't care if you're working representationally or not. You want to look at your composition, <clears throat> excuse me, from every possible angle because that's the best way to assess and analyze the design that you're building. Mm -hmm. So I took the opportunity to flip this upside down when I was blow drying and it also allows me to see the shapes in an entirely new way. Um, and I can respond to that. So it's still a little bit wet in some areas, but I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put some more marks down. Uh, I, I like this blue vibe that I'm feeling here, and, and I also like the little bits of orange and yellow that play off of that. So I'm thinking that might be the direction that I go. But um, meanwhile, I'm going to put some more, some more marks down and on the piece in this particular direction. A couple of people have asked um, what I made the blue marks with or what I'm using. Um, it's a Derwent product. It's a water-soluble um, tool. They're really heavily pigmented. They're called ink tents blocks. So I grabbed another one. This is kind of an um, orange color. It's similar to this. And um, I'm just going to do the same thing again that I did in the first step. I'm just going to repeat it. You can really see that there's a good amount of texture here because I can't get an even line down. Uh, what color to use next? Mm, let's do a little bit of an acidy green. So there's a bit of gold here, um, metallic, that I really like, and I intentionally kept my mark around that. Um, I want to preserve that. I think it's probably from two or three paintings ago, but it just, I like it and it feels right. And so what I have been trying to do as of late is when I really like the feeling of something, I don't even question it. I, I just try to embrace it. So. I don't want to have to continue to remember to preserve this. So what I'm going to do is tear a little piece of masking tape. And I'm just going to cover it. I'm going to cover it with the masking tape. And then hopefully, I will remember to remove the tape at the very end. Sometimes I forget and the tape's actually embedded in the piece forever. Okay. I still have this paper plate with some um, medium on it. I'm going to add a little bit more. And yes, my plate is blue on it. I don't really care. Um, I could clean it, but I really, I'm not, I'm not going to worry. That green is really, it's sort of like a green gold, those of you who are familiar with acrylic paint colors. It's got a really powerful, acidy feel to that color. So I'm coming in now with this gel medium and I'm and I'm just sort of sealing my paint underneath it, or not my paint, my marks. But what I'm also doing, I'm also mixing a little bit of color into the gel medium with my paint itself. And mixing that into the marks or the pigment that I've laid down. And I'm going to hit this with a good amount of water because I want it to run.
is really pretty um, interesting already. One thing that I find is difficult to maintain when doing a demo is um, pacing oneself. When I demo, I tend to work a lot more quickly than I do when I'm painting by myself. Um, I don't know if it's adrenaline or what, but I'm being I'm aware of that. Um, if I were if I were working on this by myself without the cameras rolling, now would be the time when I would sit down with my notebook and um, write some thoughts about this one, um, spend some time with my feelings and um, try to figure out if there's a message here, what, what is emerging. Um, so sort of an abbreviated version of this, because in real life, that could be um, anywhere from a half hour to 45 minutes. Um, I, I'm feel, I, I see that there's almost like a trap, sensation of a trap, the circle keeps going around and there there's chaos in it which those of you who follow my work know chaos has been a theme lately um there's a little bit of tenderness and, and beauty and nuance happening but there's also a good amount of agitation around this perimeter here um there's a struggle a battle of some sort um and i, and I like the tension that those two things create Typically, I have an animal or figure as part of my part of my focal point, um, and and sometimes I start out in advance, expecting or wanting to work with a particular animal. Sometimes, like with my daydream paintings, I sort of wait and see what what shows up. So I'm kind of feeling I don't I don't see it yet, but I'm kind of feeling like. A mouse because this reminds me of a hamster wheel um, that may, that maybe there's a mouse in this somewhere but I don't know so I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep open to that but I do really like the composition that I've got so far of the circle that's happening um, I really love my colors and, and the color choices the blue was originally just a response to my mood, um, but this green came from bits of green that I saw in the original painting, and this orangey, um, brownish color came as a, an intentional response or a, um, a um, complementary sort of choice to that blue. And let me show you something here. So, um, we know that complements, colors that sit across from each other on the color wheel, when they're put together, there's a vibration that happens. Um, and, and they make each other feel stronger. So, when I was thinking of or, or, or looking at this blue and really liking the intensity of this blue and, and wanting to amplify it, because this is... This blue is what I'm feeling. I, I, want, I want to sort of shout it out to the world um, in order to make this blue shout, which kind of sits between these two, I need to have its complement in there as well. And that's where this sort of orangey brown, which you see here, comes into play as a complement of this blue here. Um, where do I put my color wheel? I'll slip it back down under here. So that's sort of part of my decision-making process. A lot of the things or the choices that I make along the way happen um, at a gut level, and so I don't necessarily, um, I'm not necessarily able to articulate them as I'm working. So if you see me do something and you're not really clear about the why, Please speak up by adding it into the comments. So Janice has asked about 
the substrate. This is just an inexpensive, it's a um, hard piece of hardboard. I probably bought it from um, Blick. <laughs> dog say hello. Um, I probably bought it from Blick. It has a um, Richeson sticker on the back of it. Jack Richeson is another um, art supplier. Uh, it is it is a surface that I really love to work on because it's relatively inexpensive and sturdy and it takes a lot of abuse. So, all right, let's see. I am... I'm going to hit this with a blow dryer again. And while I'm blow drying, my eyes are traveling around the piece too, and I'm, I'm looking for passages that feel powerful, for passages that make me move, that make me pause, um, that, that give me, that reflect back to me what I'm feeling. I don't believe this is entirely dry, but that's okay, I'm gonna stop blow drying for now. Um, and as I was drying, I was thinking about how much that little speck of gold pleased me, and that maybe I want a little bit more of that. So, I am digging out my tub of paint pens. Um, this is, uh, ooh, you probably can't read it because of the lighting. This is a Posca paint pen. Uh, I have a whole tub of these in a variety of different colors. I love these things. Um, and this one happens to be gold, and it has a pretty good gold um, metallic end on it, a good solid nib. So this nib is, is active, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this pen, and I'm going to start up here where this gold is, and I'm just going to sort of allow this marker to get drug across. Do you see how I'm holding it in an untraditional fashion? I'm not holding it with your typical grip. If I held it like this, then I'm gonna get these really tight marks. And I don't want those. I want things that are looser, that feel a little bit less in control, because that is exactly, exactly what I'm dealing with at this moment in time. And I'm just making marks. I'm not trying to, to make them be pretty. I'm, I'm trying to reactivate the nib here and clean it off because it, it did pick up a good amount of crud from the painting. I probably should have waited for the painting to be completely dry because I don't want to have I don't want to have ruined this marker now. There we go. 
Okay. I'm just going to gently pull it across here. It's going to pick up texture. And I'm just thinking about this little nubbin piece down here as the origin of the gold marks. There. I'm going to clean this off one more time on my paper plate before I put it back in the jar so, or in the tub so that I don't cry the next time I pull it out. All right. I don't know if you can see. But there, that gold paint actually has a really lovely sheen to it. It's a nice, a nice response. And I really love this pink color, but I don't have, I don't have pink in Derwent. I only have dark colors. But I'd really like to get some more pink there. So I'm going to grab a piece. This is just a piece of sidewalk chalk. Let's see what I can do with this. Oh yeah, that's that's a good color. Now, now is a great time for me to point out that anything that is not inside this circle or gold or this bit of green, all of these other areas are um, residual from the original painting that I started out with. So um, these are um, marks that were already here, and they're already complementing and working, going along with um, this piece quite well. I really like, I like the story that they're telling, the way they sort of amplify or go along with each other. Okay, now because I've put chalk on the surface, I need to... Um, I need to put a layer of gel medium over all of this because the chalk is not really permanent and it's going to continue to move every time I hit it with, um, every time I hit it with paint or brush or any other mark. So I've just got some, um, acrylic medium here and I have a, a brush that was sitting in water so I'm going to sort of pinch it to soak the water out. Um, acrylics are water-based product, which means that you can clean your brushes very easily, but what it also means is that every time you, you bring water from your brush or your water jar to your palette or your paint, you're watering it down. And when you water your, your paints down, you can see through them. They become like a watercolor, which, if that's the effect you want, that transparency, go for it. But there are times when I don't want that transparency. I want, I want my paints to be opaque. I want to have full control over my paint and how transparent or opaque it is. So I try to avoid adding as much water as possible because that gives me full control over my uh, opacity. Now I'm just going to gently skim the whole surface. Every time I put a layer of paint on my panel, I'm sort of reducing or eliminating that grit from the gesso. So I'm aware of the fact that I have a limited amount of time at the onset here where I can really 
lay pencil type marks down and take advantage of them. Okay. It's kind of a hot mess. And there's a lot of things that are unresolved here. But I'm going to rotate this. And I'm going to look at it from different angles and see where how the energy of the piece changes and whether or not that matches up with what I'm feeling. This direction feels too much like it's a race. I don't I don't I don't like this. This doesn't this doesn't work for me. I I do like this quite a bit. I love what's happening here. And I feel like there's a scramble or something that's going on down here. And and but yet there's light and hope or reason for hope up here. But I'm not really sure that this area works quite yet. This does nothing for me either. Now I want to point out that my reaction to this piece may be totally different than yours. You may look at it this way and fall totally in love with it and see like a cove and, and it becomes a landscape and a beach scene or whatever whatever story you weave into it, that is totally your prerogative and that, that's fantastic. I, I always love hearing when other people find stories in my work and they relate to them and I wanna hear those stories. But what's important for me at this point in the painting process is that I listen to my story. I ask myself, what is my story? which orientation, which marks build that story and make it resonate with me. So it's important to eliminate outdoor noise, so to speak, or noise from other sources and stay true to what your own gut is telling you your story is. And that's also hard to do in a demo because I don't get to go into that internal space and um, think these things through privately. I have to speak them out loud and that somehow slows the whole, the whole process down. But I do think that this is going to be a um, portrait style piece as opposed to a landscape. And something about this area is just really, really works for me. We're still a little bit sticky, so I'm going to hit this with the blow dryer. As you can imagine, I spend a lot of time blowing my paintings dry, or I, I work on four of them at once. And I just, when it's wet, I set it aside and the next one comes up. Uh, because dry time is a big part of my um, painting process. <laughs>
surface still feels a little bit sticky. But I'm going to go back into it anyway because I can. I am reaching for some, some more tools here. Bear with me. There, that's the one that I want. So I have a couple of pencils here. I'm going to make some more marks. This is a Staedtler um, multi-purpose pencil. It's or I'm sorry, Stabilo, and it's water soluble. This is their blue one. I absolutely love the shade of blue. And since I'm falling in love with blue here, it's an excuse for me to pull this out and use it some more. And then this is just a water soluble graphite pencil. Um, I am going to, even though I don't think the composition works this way, I'm going to make some marks on it in this orientation. And, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to ch I channel some of the things that I'm feeling today. I'm feeling very frightened and anxious and worried. Um, and so I'm just going to use my tool to sort of make those marks. Um, and you, you won't see this, but I'm actually going to be closing my eyes in doing that. So the marks that I'm making are an energy-based um, mark that comes from inside of me instead of a mark that's in response to what's here. On, on the panel. Um, that can be risky or scary, but like I mentioned at the very beginning of the video, um, I have to embrace the element of taking risk and not allowing this to be too precious in order for the full expression of what I'm feeling to, um, to develop. So here we go. This pencil's really inadequate. I want something bigger. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab a bigger piece of charcoal here. Oh, I can also see that um, I dug right through the paint because it wasn't totally cured. Um, I can't do anything about it now. It's already done. I would have preferred not to have done that, but you know what? Hindsight, right? We all, we all know and, and understand that, oh, this is, this is sort of peeling it off too. And I'm not able to get the big wide marks that I want. Okay, so this tool isn't working. Um, and instead of fighting with the tool, I'm just going to put it away and I'm going to pull out something else. Let's see if this one will work. So, uh, no, I want, I want a softer one. Here we go. So this is a Alira. It's a water-soluble graphite stick. It's kind of like a big, chunky jumbo crayon. It's scratching through the surface, too. So you know what? I'm just going to go with it. disturbs me. It feels very, very, very gritty. But I know that's one of the words, and grittiness, the rawness is something that I've, I've 
talked about feelings, so it's very uncomfortable to look at, just like it is sort of very uncomfortable to live with. So I have just a little bit of paint here on my brush, and I'm going to go in here, and I can tell, as soon as I start to make these marks, I'm thinking, yeah, I just talked about how uncomfortable it is to work, look at and live with, but now look, I'm painting over it. It's like I don't, I want to deny that it's there. So I guess I don't want to cover it all up, per se. Let's go back in and draw over top of the marks that I made. This is just regular water. Notice how I'm holding my brush. I don't recommend this sort of scrapey mark be made with a super expensive or high quality brush. This is just an inexpensive one. And I also always use bristle brushes. I mean, I'm sorry, I always use synthetics with my paints because Natural hair bristles get broken down by um, acrylic paint, and since they're super expensive, I don't want to waste an expensive brush on um, on paint that's just going to break it down anyway. So I tend to buy a lot of really relatively inexpensive brushes, and because I paint every day. I drew them pretty quickly. I scratched through this layer of paint that I just put on here. The gold that's underneath shows through like a drawn line, which is a cool effect. sorts of marks that I'm making are really different than um, the careful kind of carved brushwork that happens when you're trying to create a likeness or build a particular sense of space. trying to be really expressive. And giving my brushwork permission to reflect a feeling instead of something that I see, which means that I have to discard previous conventions or beliefs on how we should be holding our brushes, 
how we should be making our marks. I find that holding my brush handle from the end like this is a great way to um, let go of trying to control what's, what's happening. See what questions you have here. Oh my, lots of them. Come back. It's not gonna let me see them all. We'll try it this way. Hmm. My internet is being slow. So the other thing that I need to be aware of is not overworking this. Um, I really don't want to destroy this with um, too many marks. Hmm. There we go. I don't want to destroy this with too many marks um, while I'm trying to figure out the direction of the piece. So now, now is the time when I want to step back and I want to look at the composition. I really like the circular shape. I like the tension that's here, the hope that's up here. How am I going to bridge that? What am I going to bring into this? Um, and I'm going to continue to ponder that, but I'm going to go look at your questions and see if I can answer any of those in the meanwhile. Um, Gail, I'm, I'm not a lefty. I think the camera has reversed things. Um, but I'm glad that you pointed that out because I want to say that this is my dominant hand, regardless of whether I'm right or left. Um, my palette is on this side of me. My brushes are on my dominant hand side. Um, all of my materials that I need to reach for and grab are on my dominant hand side. If I had a reference photo, it would be on my non-dominant hand side um, so that my eye can move from the reference to the painting undisturbed. Um, and having all of my tools on the dominant hand side means that I can simply shift my weight and rotate at the waist, load my brush, and come back here for a mark. Um, I'm not having to cross over the painting to get to water or paint. Um, I, and it, it just, it greatly simplifies everything for me. So um, there you go. There's my little lecture on setting your studio up. Patty, it is so hard to turn out noise. You are so right. And um, yeah, in, in life as well as in our painting process. I agree with that completely. Um, let's see. Bonnie, you see a mare in her foal at dawn. I love that. That's a really peaceful, peaceful, peaceful vision. Um, I, I'm not sure where the where the piece was, what point the piece was at when you saw that, but I'm really grateful that you shared that because I do like, I, I do like the idea that there is um, a couple generations in in this painting, a mare and a foal. That's quite beautiful. Um, Penny, I'm using various mediums to paint over my chalks. Um, yes, I am. I All my mediums are, with the exception of the Liquitex Clear Gesso, are golden products. And I have them in a variety of um, proportions and I keep them in squeeze bottles. But basically I use them um, to alter the viscosity of my paint and then I also use them to alter or push these marks, these marks that I've applied with water-soluble tools in some way. So the choice of my medium uh, or, the, or the, the sort of uh, the sort of end result that I desire with respect to whether I'm working with paint or whether I'm working with chalk, 
whether I, I want it to move, whether I want it to sit still, um, all of those sorts of properties that, that I desire or that I would like to see happen, um, those are all determined by the sort of medium that I use or the mixture of that. Um, and I think I've gone into this in greater detail in my Patreon classroom in the magic space. Um, and it's really, it's a matter of experimentation and figuring out what works for you. Um, so there you go. That's a, that's a great question, though. I am, um, I, I'm not a golden product consultant, but uh, I use the majority of the paints that I use, with the exception of two or three new colors, are golden ones, and um, they're varnishes and other things that I use as well, as, as well as mediums. So there you go. Is that it for your questions? Looks like it is at this moment. Okay. So I'm gonna look at this piece again in both of these directions. And I'm thinking about the um, sort of the mouse on the wheel analogy. And if I were to put one, where might he go? If I put the mouse down here, sort of like he's getting carried back, he's in danger of getting spun out of the canvas and this conflict would be coming down and around. If I put him here, he would get flipped up out of the conflict into the light. Although if he's running here, if he's running into the middle of the painting here, he could in theory also get flipped off the canvas, but then potentially come up here. I'm not really sure which one feels right. And if I weren't demoing, I may choose to set this piece aside for a number of days or weeks and wait for a clearer answer to come to me. I don't really have that luxury today. I'm fearful that if I put the mouse here I'm going to paint over this, this grittiness, and I kind of think that's important. And if I put the mouse here, there may be too much happening from a texture design sort of concern or consideration. So my best bet might be the mouse here. And then I kind of have a design triangle happening between this area and this area and that. Now the other thing I want to think about is this little point of gold and how important that is as the source for these threads that have gone out into into the painting. And if that's important, what is its relationship going to be to the mouse? Is the mouse going to be like right here then? Hmm. I'm not really sure. 
I'm going to hit this area with a blow dryer and I'm going to think about it some more because I'm fairly certain that this is going to be the area that I'm going to work on next. So let's get it nice and dry before we do that. certain about the placement of something I can always audition it and that's an easy enough thing to do with a piece of chalk as long as my surface is dry um, and it feels a little bit tacky I'm going to um, I'm gonna risk it though normally I would like go make a sandwich or check my email or do something that would give me 10-15 minutes on this piece but I'm not gonna do that right now um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna draw very lightly. So this is just a cheap piece of sidewalk chalk, and I'm gonna figure out where I want this where I want this mouse and how big I want it and what direction do I want to go in. I think I want to run in this way. to kind of alter her body so that you can tell that she's sort of running, right? And how do I want her tail? Now, I kind of just drew this from memory. And I'm not sure that it's entirely accurate. But it doesn't have to be. Because this is an expressive painting. No one is going to come up to this painting and compare the mouse I've drawn to a literal, actual mouse and pass judgment. I mean, I suppose they could if they wanted to, but hopefully the world has got better things to do. Um, so for me, as long, it, for me, my goal is that the user, the viewer sits and looks at this 
and says, oh, you know what? That looks like a mouse. Um, so I just need it to be generic enough that it kind of, uh, that it's identifiable. And I'm trying to figure out the curve of the tail here. Because my surface is dry, I can just brush this right off. I don't really know if mice run with their tails curved up over their head, or if their tails relax and go straight out. I think I kind of want it going back because the curve breaks the composition. Maybe I do both. Maybe I, maybe I stretch it out that way. Yeah. So if I pull it out further from the body, that will work. I think he does need a friend. Okay. Yeah, and this one's tail can definitely go off because I don't want it to go off and any other sort of curvature is going to break this dynamic that I have. And I sort of want this one to feel like he might be. This one's more aware of the viewer. He might be looking at us. And this one is more aware of the task at hand. Okay. I'm just going to, actually no, I'm not going to do that. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to draw these with a um, ebony pencil. Just a regular drawing pencil and the lines don't move at all and I'm not going to draw them super super clean again I'm just drawing them using my memory boy I sure do wish the surface was smoother here Probably can't can't see him. Or her. But there's the one. This other one. I don't think my head is quite right. Because these are not final, they're going to probably be changed several times. I'm uh, not going to worry about it. And I am going to go in because it's important to me that I see them. I don't want to pick them out right now. 
overly powerful in the composition, but I do want to be able to see them as shapes for a design element that is important. So I'm just going to go and I'm going to put a delicate wash in. This is, um, well, I watered it down quite a bit, but it looks like maybe I didn't water it down quite enough. So let's just do this. Hit it with water and then lift it with a rag. So I just hit it with water to keep the paint from drying, and then lifted it with a little bit of a um, rag. And I will do the same with this one. There's a little bit of pink. I'm not going to overwork it though. Now I'm just going to take my water soluble pencil and I'm going to find lines, design elements. going to pick them out. We have this circle is happening. I really don't like the texture. Of chalk. I can't really get, can't get much mark on here because it's pretty wet, so that's not going to work right now. I guess I just need to go in with paint. So again, I'm going to pinch, because my paintbrush has been in water, I'm going to pinch it off. Pick up some color. I'm going to hold my brush.
do not have any black paint on my palette. I typically don't use it. I have a good amount of um, darker values with respect to color. So I have some um, Prussian blue and uh, raw umber, as well as Payne's gray. Now what I'm going to do is I sort of want to unify the surface of it. So I'm going to mix a glaze. A glaze is paint that is intentionally transparent. And um, you can do that a couple of different ways. Like I mentioned earlier, um, a paint's opacity is controlled, acrylic paint's opacity is controlled by how much water you add to it. But you can also um, control it with a product called Glazing Medium. And Glazing Medium is just, uh, is just that. It, it turns or disperses the pigment evenly, a bit more evenly than water does, um, and makes it transparent, almost like a watercolor sort of effect. Um, but it's really quite, it, it can be quite beautiful. And you can control how uh, transparent your glaze is by how much paint you choose to add to it. So I have just made a glaze here with some uh, Payne's Gray. And I'm sort of loosely putting it on here I'm, I'm trying to carve it in around somewhat neatly around the shapes down here and up along one of the mice tails mices mouses and I'm just gonna pick up some more paint and more glaze definitely altering the, the value jumps because this is a darker glaze it's pushing everything into the darker realm easily work this edge. I'm going to get my credit card. 
I'm gonna see what I can do. Well, that just scratched the heck out of the surface. But you can see that I'm able to scrape into this. even more and lift some of the glaze off. Off a little bit of the marks that I see here. don't want to get too fussy. If I make too many tiny marks, it gets super busy. And then um, I feel like I get lost sometimes in the beauty of all the different marks and I forget to pay attention to the overall message. So you'll see me go into some of these spaces that actually are quite beautiful, but I'm going to cover them up because I'm not certain that ultimately they're going to serve my message. Well, they will be beautiful to look at. I like the pink against that yellow green. And actually, I like it so much that I'm going to pull some of it down here, too. Well, the painting surface itself is getting gummy and thick. So I need to be aware that I'll have to take a break at some point to um, really let the surface cure and catch up. Barely touching my brush to the surface. My 
using my finger because this is a cadmium or this has some cadmium in it. And I don't want I don't want that to get into my under my skin or through my skin and into my bloodstream. I think that might be too much. Oh, it helps if you spray the painting and that yourself. So I'm gonna moisten that. there needs to be a bit more of a peek at that yellow up here. And as much as I love this orange here, I'm wondering what would happen if it had a bit more blue to it. It's sort of like an alizarin instead of a... You've seen three different horses. Oh, that's awesome. Love that. Linda, I'm glad that you're tuned in and enjoying it. Thank you. So as I look at this now, it's, it's a very intriguing piece. And I see... I see a couple of things. So I love, I love these mice on the wheel. And um, this one is either getting swept off or it's just starting to step off the wheel, which is kind of a nice analogy for uh, what today represents for Americans. Um, this one is continuing to run and keep the wheel spinning. There's conflict but it's breaking up and this little bit of gold how about if I peel this piece of tape off down here oh that little bit of gold is quite lighter much lighter than I remembered it being but this is an interesting play here and um I may choose to use this lighter iridescent sort of gold, scraping some of that into the mice. I feel like I need to soften what's happening in the middle here um, with some glazes because these lines are just as strong as these ones and I think I need them to exist on another plane. And I need to have some more um, graphite. There's a lot of blue right now, or a lot of thick blue, I guess. Maybe I need some more, some more lighter things. So those are the things that I'm going to ponder. Um, but I think I'm going to sign off now. It looks like I've been live for almost two hours. Um, I'm going to sign off now, make myself a sandwich spend some, some contemplative time with this piece. Uh, and I'm gonna try to come back in a little bit and, um, and work on it live some more later today so that you can continue to watch. But meanwhile, how about if I just bring this in closer so that you can see, oh, there's a good amount of glare on it. If I do that, isn't there? There you go. The bottom of the piece is not as dark as the camera suggests. It's kind of more of a middle value. Uh, a little bit darker, maybe a half step darker than the upper area here. But this gives you a sense of the composition now and where it's standing at the moment. And um, I will be, 
I will be back later on. Thanks for watching and um, following along. I hope that you are enjoying your morning, your day. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.